All right, welcome everybody. Uh, hopefully uh, you've lasted this long. You can make it through one or two more talks before the end of KubeCon. Um, but we're thankful you stuck around enough to come here about Container D. Uh, this is our uh, maintainer update that uh, Derek and I and other maintainers from the project are here in the room. We've usually rotated these around at KubeCon and um, try and give just an update on what's been happening in the project. And today, um, you know, a good half of this talk will focus on Containerd 2.0, which just went beta on Monday. So uh, hopefully you'll uh, get to hear more about that. Uh, but I just wanted to start with some, you know, basic updates about the project, the velocity, the community, and uh, <clears throat> always timely that Datadog or Sysdig usually comes out with a state of containers report, you know, usually a week or so before KubeCon. So this is just uh, from last week, uh, one of their top 10 indicators um, about container adoption was the use of Containerd itself. And uh, their highlight here from their graph was that the adoption of Containerd has doubled in the last year. And again, you know, much of that is uh, probably related to the Docker shim deprecation, a lot more people moving to Containerd as a runtime for Kubernetes. But again, um, great to see that growth of usage that adds to what was already you know, significant use uh, with every Docker installation. There was Containerd as well and other uh, existing adopters. Related to that, the CNCF puts out a velocity report, and I realize you know, the, the chart here is incredibly busy, um, but Container D came out as uh, the 13th uh, you know, highest velocity. Again, there's some algorithm that looks at sort of committers and PR and issue activity. And so again, um, you know, just a sort of stake in the ground that Containerd continues to be a very healthy project with a lot of involvement across the ecosystem. Uh, related to that, uh, we've been excited, you know, since the last KubeCon to have a lot of new maintainers. If you look at our project governance, um, we have sort of uh, two levels of, of uh, activity. We have a reviewer role and a committer role. We call that whole group maintainers. They're, they're all maintainers of the project. Most of these uh, are new reviewers to the project who then, as they mature in their um, involvement in the project, can move on to become committers as well. So it's really cool to see the diversity in this group. There's people from Microsoft and Google and VMware. And again, just kind of continuing uh, this um, activity in the project that is really very broad across our ecosystem. It's not all about one, one group's cloud or, or project or, or product. Um, so anyway, great to see this. And I'm especially excited that one of my colleagues, uh, AWS Henry Wang, is now a, a reviewer as well. Uh, cool to see some of our uh, young SDEs get involved in the project as well. Um, Obviously, one of the ways that we see adoption growing is through Kubernetes distributions or managed Kubernetes offerings. Um, I won't uh, bore you by reading you know, every title of every Kubernetes distro here, but you, you know, many of these have existed for a while. Some of them are newer adopters. Uh, and again, this is just a represented, uh, representation of Kubernetes. Uh, there's always you know, existing other adoption you know, AWS Fargate uses Containerd, which is not a Kubernetes distribution. You've got Docker's use of Containerd uh, within Docker Desktop, within the Docker engine. Um, so again, we continue to see growth in overall project adoption. One of the things we've really focused on in the last few years, and Derek's gonna talk about this some more, um, is really we've tried to build Containerd for extensibility. You know, we focused on this core that has now been around since um, 2016 and donated to the CNCF in 2017. So in many ways, the core of the project is fairly mature. But as we've uh, matured, we've tried to make sure that you can add uh, capabilities, functionality, or consume Containerd in a way 
that's valuable for your use case. So you know that uh, sort of one end of the spectrum is building your own client or using the various client interfaces. So the Kubelet obviously uses the CRI interface of ContainerD uh, as a client. Uh, you've got you know Docker, BuildKit, CTR, NerdCTL. You have a set of other clients using the Go SDK. Um, and again, that's an extensible way that you can build around ContainerD. Uh, at the other end, you know, at the, the back end of ContainerD, there's a set of built-in snapshotters, and there's really been this growth and expansion uh, into uh, remote snapshotters that are proxied in that let you do things like lazy loading images. So um, we have Kohei here who's created StarGZ snapshotter to kind of kick off that work that's grown into Sochi and Nidus and other uh, lazy loading snapshotters that exist today. And that's a way that you can expand ContainerD for your own use case. And then as well as shims. So one of the most recent ones is the run WASI shim that allows you to use ContainerD to drive WASM workloads. We have an existing set of shims. Some of them have been around since the start of the project, like the default run C shim. And there's other pluggable interfaces, and, and as Derek walks through some of the architecture, you'll see other ways that we're trying to make sure that ContainerD remains a pluggable, expandable, extensible um, project. I just mentioned clients, and I'll try not to you know, belabor all the ways that uh, the client area has grown over time to uh, you know, give Derek some time so you can read a lot of the, the words on the slide. Uh, CTR is, it has existed since we started the project. Many of you know about NerdCTL, which Akihiro, one of our maintainers, created that gives you a more complete uh, Docker-compatible client. The Kubernetes project has CRI CTL, which allows you to drive just the CRI interface uh, and any other CRI-compatible Runtime would also uh, can work with CRI CTL. And then the, the one I wanted to make sure to mention is, is that, uh, you know, I've mentioned that Docker continue, continues to use ContainerD underneath its uh, project. But there's been some expansion of that in that they've started, they have an experimental feature first in Docker Desktop, it's in the Mobi project as well, that allows you to use ContainerD's image store which, um, you know, as I just mentioned about the extensible snapshotters, one of the values is now that means that Docker and Mobi clients can take advantage of some of that extensibility and use some of these custom snapshotters. And so that work is ongoing in the Docker Mobi project. And then there's higher layer platforms being built around that. Many of you have heard of Colima or Finch that my team created at AWS or Rancher Desktop coming out of uh, Rancher and SUSE. And these are higher layer platforms building around some of these tools like NerdCTL. Um, I mentioned snapshotters. There's a ton of built-in core snapshotters that have, have existed, many of them since uh, the start of the project, but block file is a new one. And then the remote snapshotters, uh, you know, extensible, uh, by being proxied into the project like StarGZ, Overlay BD, Nidus, uh, Sochi, uh, a project we open sourced, and GKE also has their image streaming built around the same uh, remote snapshotter technology. Uh, so again, that's a way that if you have an int interesting idea or use case, you can extend and create your own snapshotter. Um, Runtimes and shims, again, I mentioned some of these already. We've always had the default uh, run C uh, runtime that uh, for Linux uh, coming out of the OCI. We also support C run. We actually have that tested as part of our CI on every PR. And then there's a few uh, alternatives and experimental runtimes that exist. Uh, shims also, as I mentioned, an area that uh, allows you to extend Container D for your use case, and Run Wazi is a uh, non-core sub-project of Container D, and there's a lot of activity happening there. 
as I said, to run WASM workloads uh, driven through Container D. Many of these others have existed uh, for a while, or we've talked about them at, at prior um, KubeCons, uh, but again, feel free to go and dig deeper uh, when you have time if you're interested in some of these shim implementers. Uh, talking a little bit about our releases, so 1.5 is fully end of life at this point. Um, 1.6 is sort of our main long-term support release that we announced uh, a KubeCon ago. Uh, Container D 1.7 was the last of the uh, 1.x line. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then Container D 2.0, as I just uh, mentioned, we just started uh, the beta release cycle and should have that released in early 2024. Uh, again, dependent on our uh, you know, testing and your testing and, and feedback on the beta and RC life cycle. There's some question marks about end of life because as you can see from um, you know, this snapshot taken straight from our releases markdown file, um, there's either a max end of life date or it's based on a specific release plus six months. And so as we have releases, those dates become clearer about the specific end of life. So as, as I mentioned, we announced this, um, I'm pretty sure last KubeCon, about our first long-term support release uh, that, that many people were happy that we'd have a release that didn't have such a short life cycle. Uh, it's supported at least until February 2025. And we've really sort of tried to create again, with some judgment calls on behalf of the maintainers and expanded scope. Usually when uh, we would only backport bug fixes to prior releases, now given we're talking about supporting this for a few years, we wanna make sure that we have the flexibility to update Go versions, to update dependencies appropriately, and to keep compatibility with you know, current and future Kubernetes releases, which sometimes requires changes to be backported into the CRI, which are effectively new features. And then as we reach uh, the end of this LTS period, we'll move this to an active release with a little more limited scope because by that time there'll be other releases that'll carry the new features into new versions and a new LTS release. Uh, 1.7, again, is our last of the 1.x line. There were, a, when we first launched 1.7, uh, we marked a set of new capabilities as experimental. I'm not gonna read through these because many of these Derek is gonna talk about in a minute. These are features that we wanted to exist in 1.7 so that people could start to try them out and use them and then finalize them and make them sort of GA ready in 2.0. And so Derek will talk through uh, many of those. Our general release plan for 2.0 is that, you know, we just uh, released the beta, beta zero on Monday. We'll have a series of beta builds, releases, move into an RC period late this year, early next year, and then hopefully um, within, you know, late January, February, have a uh, 2.0 GA. And again, there's a set of components that uh, we'll move from experimental to fully supported in 2.0. Um, one of the you know, reasons to sort of semver around a new major release is to finish uh, the deprecation. Many things that have been marked deprecated for many releases are now removed in 2.0. Uh, the only one I crossed out, grayed out, is the uh, config file version. And that's because um, Derek was able to create a config migration implementation. So instead of you having to rewrite your config, uh, removing you know, deprecated uh, config properties and the format, the migration will do that for you in 2.0. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Derek to take us through a lot of these features that are going to be supported in 2.0. All right, thank you, Phil. Um, so we'll, we'll start to go through some of these features. Um, we're not going to go through kind of the, the high-level architecture that we've 
gone through in many other KubeCons. Uh, we're going to kind of focus on what, what we're adding new in 2.0 and some of these, these new services and APIs that, that we've added. Uh, so one of the big ones we've added is this, is this new Sandbox API. Um, think of the Sandbox API. It's, it's, it's an API that we can now use to group together containers. So traditionally, that was done via the shim. Um, but the, if, if you had played around with this at all, you'd see that the life cycle of the sandbox was the life cycle of a container, and there was always some complication about trying to figure that out. It, it wasn't very explicit before, whereas as now we have an API that can actually handle uh, a sandbox as a first, as a first class concept. Um, so we have a few different interfaces around that for basically creating and updating this, the sandbox environment um, and you know, some, of the, some of the use cases around that for uh, some of the multi-platform or, or different VM use cases. Uh, we, we added some configuration around it so that the sand, sandboxes or sandboxers, as, as, as they're called right now, um, work similar to snapshotters. So as, as part of our goal to have that, that extensibility and pluggability, snapshotters have been a pretty good success in that you can have many different implementations of it and you can, you can select it um, via configuration or even via runtime. It's, it's, it's kind of similar here. Uh, so we end up with an architecture that, that, that kind of looks like this for the, for the sandbox environment. So um, if we had two different sandboxers being the pod sandbox, which is what kind of exists today, um, and then kind of a new shim sandbox, which uses some of the new APIs, uh, the pod sandbox does um, what you'd expect in terms of it's, it's going to create a container, um, what, what you would know is like the pods container today uh, in Kubernetes. Uh, that's that's going to hold open uh, all the namespaces and everything associated with that, that pod sandbox environment. Um, and then it's going to go ahead and, and do all the, the task creation, task management. Um, in container D, the, we have a single shim that will handle that. So, uh, we'll have a shim process that actually serves uh, the task API, and you know we'll, we'll talk to that via via shim manager. Uh, w what's really new here with the, with the sandbox service is now you can create that that shim environment before you even create the container. You can you can alter that environment separately from having to make alterations to those containers and basically have that environment without the containers, and then uh, go and create that later. Um, it it it. It introduces this new sandbox service at the actual shim layer, so the actual shims will have a new uh, service that uh, the sandboxer inside of uh, container D can, can talk to. Um, in the future, this gives us a little bit more flexibility in defining what, what a shim is and what, what, the, what the API between container D is and, and the shim, uh, whereas traditionally it was, there was a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, container D's cap capabilities and, and the task service. Uh, now we actually have a little bit more uh, room for extensibility there. Um, the other kind of area in the runtime is, uh, is the NRI, the, the node resource interface. Um, this happens a little bit earlier in, in the process. Um, it's, it's in between when the CRI is handling it and when we actually generate the, the OCI runtime uh, specification. Uh, NRI's uh, a pl a pluggable interfaces, has these pluggable interfaces where you can take the OCI spec, uh, you can call into a various set of NRI plugins and actually make adjustments uh, to the OCI spec. So you can think of anything you want to do around dynamic resource allocation, um, if you want to allocate parts of your GPU, everything there, um, it's actually a pluggable interface um, for doing that. Uh, so it, it, it keeps Containerd pretty simple. We, we don't have to uh, make changes to Containerd for every type of uh, node resource that, that you might want to uh, allocate to your container here. So uh, we've added support for this. And I believe I heard that some of the other container runtimes have adopted this as well. So um, it's something that, that we can use across, across the ecosystem here. Uh, so what, what that ends up looking like from a Containerd perspective is, you know, there's two different ways that you can plug these in. You have NRI uh, binaries. Um, you can also have a socket uh, that, that the NRI plugin is listening on. Um, the, the plugin will register itself, and when a new container request comes in, 
Um, it sends that request down to NRI, and the NRI is able to send those container updates back to containerd uh, so that it can, uh, it can be passed down to the runtime configuration. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the transfer service. So this was something that we added in 1.7. Traditionally in containerd, we've, we've had this kind of fat client model. Uh, so everything related to pushing and pulling of images was done in the client, and we have a, a whole bunch of low, lower level services for managing snapshots, managing images, managing content, um, even down to we have pluggability for like uh, doing the differ, um, uh, calculating the difference between those and applying the different layers uh, to, the, to the snapshots. Um, but if, if you're trying to re-implement this from scratch, it's, 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 it's a little challenging. Um, CRI ended up having like kind of a circular dependency on our own client because of this. Um, and it's, it's led to kind of some weird behavior where if you're using a client such as or CTL, you might have a registry configuration and you have another configuration in CRI um, and they're not using the same uh, implementation for this. So the transfer service is aiming to solve that, um, but it's aiming to solve it in a, in a way that's fairly generic and simple. So you can see that the, the interface that we've defined for the transfer service is extremely simple. We have a source and we have a destination. Um, it's, it's fairly generic in terms of what those source and destinations could be. Um, so if, if the source is a registry and the destination is uh, your local image store, um, that's, that's a pull command. If, if you're going from an image store to a registry, that's a push command. If you have a, like a, an archive, like an OCI archive or something, and you're going into the image, image store, that's, that's an import. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of generalized some of these operations for transferring images uh, to different locations and adding a service so that we can do it, but also uh, in a way that, that can be easily extend, uh, extensible in the future, where we can easily add different sources, uh, different destinations, different, uh, uh, different functionality for, for doing that. So uh, there's a few that aren't implemented today, such as registry to registry, um, which is just, a, you can think of that as a, as a mirror oper uh, mirroring operation. Um, so internally, the, the transfer service looks like uh, we have our service layer. The client is going to, uh, when it initiates a pull, um, it's going to just send that, that request to the transfer service. Behind the scenes, there's a few things that, that are being done here. So we have another service called the streaming service, which is uh, just a generic way for handling a stream of data from the client uh, to, uh, to the daemon in this case. Um, it's able to create a stream and set that identifier in the transfer request um, in order to do stuff uh, such as returning progress back from the daemon back to the client. Um, it's also uh, really useful for being able to make requests from the daemon back to the client for uh, getting credentials. Um, that's been a, a, a sticky point uh, for a while when you have a daemon side transfer is at what point do you get credentials and what do you get them for? In this case, you can configure, you can configure the daemon uh, to talk to different, various different mirrors or whatever your registry configuration is and actually get the appropriate credentials for that when you actually make the request to the registry. Um, and then we have these different objects that are playing a, a much smaller role. So the, the registry source is going to use a Canary resolver that's always existed, which will contact the remote registry. Um, and then we have the image store destination that's responsible for doing stuff like unpack and uh, doing all the content manipulation and image storage. So if, if we break down what a, what a poll looks like today, it's, this, this, this is the simple case. We have a client, it's gonna get a manifest from uh, a registry using the, the distribution uh, API. It's gonna get a manifest, it's gonna get a config, and then once it has that config, it knows which layers it needs. Um, to, to get that complete image. It's gonna go and it's gonna fetch each of those layers. It's gonna store them in the content store. And then at that point, uh, the, the, the fetch of the image is done from a Canary perspective. Now we're gonna go through each of those layers. We're gonna prepare a snapshot. We're gonna apply uh, the diff. Um, in this case, they're just tar streams. Um, so we're going to untar each of those into the snapshot. Um, 
by reading the content from the content store, uh, mounting, doing the diff, and then get, getting back the uh, identifier for that layer, and then we're gonna commit that snapshot. And then in the end, we create an image pointing to that top snapshot. Um, now, we, we've optimized this a little bit, so you can do some of these operations in parallel, uh, where when you go to get the manifest, you get the config, you know, you know what the final snapshot is that you're gonna need. Uh, so you can check to see if you have that snapshot. If you already have it, uh, you don't actually need to pull any more content in order to get that, uh, in order to make that image available. Um, so when it's not available, we're gonna go through a similar process. We're gonna now prepare a snapshot, but now we can wait. Once, once we know we need to create that snapshot, we can kick off that, that fetch operation and actually do that fetch operation in parallel for all the layers that are needed. Um, as they become available, we do those um, we do the, we apply those diffs, and then in the end, we'll get a, a created image. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit more optimized because we can start doing these in parallel. Um, now, the real kind of time saver is kind of what, we, what Phil was mentioning before around lazy loading. Um, and this is where you can almost erase tar completely from the picture, uh, where once we have that config, we, we know what the final snapshot is that we're gonna need. Um, we, when we go to prepare that snapshot, if we have a snapshotter that's smart enough to know uh, where it can actually get that content from in the most efficient way to make that file system available, because that's all we need in the end is uh, we need the snapshotter to make the file system available. It can actually go to the registry directly to get the content it needed, and it can just return to container D that I have everything I need to make the file system available if the snapshotter exists. You can just commit it, create the image, and the snapshotter can actually fetch all the content as needed in the background, um, or whatever the implementation of, of the snapshotter is in that case. Um, but you can, you can see how these, these operations can short circuit through pretty fast um, uh, to make a pull as, as, as quick as possible without having to go through all those extra steps. Um, so uh, for the transfer service, some of the, some of the uh, new use cases and extensibility points here. Uh, some of this was written for confidential computing where we actually want a service that we can put in different places and it could be behind a, a, an, an, a confidential or secure enclave environment. Um, some of the OCI refers work um, that uh, I know some of it, like some of the lazy loading implementations make use of refers, um, being able to actually get those and make those available. Uh, we do have some ongoing uh, image validation work that, that's going on as well. Um, and some of that's been merged and will, it'll be in, in 2.0. Um, but there's also more, more work that's being done for stuff like making credential management uh, better. Um, and then obviously the work to get, uh, we're updating the CRI plugin in order to use the transfer service so that we have one common implementation. Um, the other big change in, in CRI that was mentioned was user namespaces. So we've added user namespace support in 1.7 for stateless pods, and then in, we have uh, kind of additional support coming in for 2.0 for, for stateful pods. Um, it's, 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 yeah, it's much more challenging, but there's, there's a lot of, uh, you can follow along some of the KEPs that are going along in Kubernetes to make, uh, make some of this work, but we've had a lot of that, stuff available in Containerd for a while with user namespaces, but having that plumbed all the way through uh, CRI is, is, is new here. Um, and then kind of lastly, I want to talk about some of the future and in-development work that's going on. Um, 1.7 was kind of an exciting release. We had a lot of experimental stuff. 2.0, I, th I think I said this a few KubeCons ago, is not designed to be an exciting release. It's designed to be a a boring release. We took experimental stuff and now we're making it stable, um, making it more usable. Um, you know, there's, there's still some loose ends we're cleaning up here uh, with the transfer service and making sandbox GA in, in the default. Um, we have some work going on for shim plugins. Um, so, I, yeah, I mentioned earlier how the shims now can have multiple services. Uh, so we want to kind of extend that concept to make it uh, give more ways that that users can manage some of those. Today we have proxy plugins. Um, the, the, so the, shim, the shims would be a, uh, shim plugins would be a way to kind of extend that farther. Um, and then we also have some higher level services that might come in 
and 2.0 around image management. Um, today, our, our APIs are pretty low level. They don't, the image service knows nothing about the snapshot or service or the container service, so you can think of a higher level service as something that can glue some of those components together and provide something um, that will really simplify some of the clients today, like NerdCTL and, and Mobi, and even possibly make it easier to, to implement new clients there. Um, same for the higher level container service. If, if you try to use Container D APIs to like start a container, that's, it's, it's challenging. There's, there's a lot of different APIs you need to call from creating a snapshot, creating a container, to, to creating a task, waiting for that task. Um, so having something simpler and higher level um, and something that can make use of some of the other features we've added, such as uh, the streaming service for, for managing kind of just basic input output over, over the API without having to necessarily touch low level FIFOs and stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, that, that's kind of what, what we have coming along in, in 2.0. Um, we hope everybody, like, wants to get involved if, if you're here. Um, like, even if, even if you're not gonna come contribute to Containerd core, um, you know, there's a huge ecosystem now of, of projects. Um, use those projects, try them out, uh, propose, you know, new projects, bring your, your own projects. It's, we're, we're constantly getting new core non-core uh, projects being added to Containerd, uh, which is, which is, is great to see. Um, we have our community meetings the second and fourth Thursday of every month. It's very specific, but you can look at the CNCF calendar if you, if you want to kind of add that to your own calendar. Um, and yeah, as always, like come open pull requests, have discussions, like I, th I think we're a pretty welcoming community and we're always looking for more uh, users come in as reviewers and, and, and more involvement. So uh, yeah, thank you everybody for, for joining. Uh, I think we might have some time for questions. I see two minutes left, but. So for, yeah, compatibility with, with Wasm. Um, I mean, a lot of that's put on the, the Wasm community for now to make their, to implement kind of the APIs we have. One of the things we're trying to do with adding more extensibility at that layer is that if Wasm has brand new functionality that maybe doesn't align with, with containers today, that um, the shims, uh, they can, they can ha have that functionality and we, we can go and support that in, in Containerd. Um, but for the most part, the compatibility burden is on them. Um, but I, th I think as that ecosystem matures a little bit, we'll be able to have like a much more like have that come back, be able to define uh, interfaces that maybe make sense. Like tasks, like our task service was written many, many years ago. It's probably the oldest, oldest API we have in Containerd back to like 2015 or something when it, when it was originally written. And it's, it's very specific to Linux containers, and as we know, like modern sandboxes and, and Wasm runtimes, they look different, they can do much, they have much more capabilities, so. Um. Hey, uh, question about uh, run, running in Kubernetes uh, with Containerd. Uh, uh, this is a question about logs uh, from containers. Uh, the logs from containers uh, in this scenario land on the uh, nodes uh, file system as files with contents, right, in specific format. Uh, this can get problematic. It has its issues. You need to have access to those files. Uh, you need the throughput on the I.O. You need to parse it, et cetera, et cetera. I was wondering if it's possible. Uh, I know Docker has something like logging drivers. I'm not sure if this is part of Containerd. Would it be possible to tell Containerd to just ship the logs via HTTP to an endpoint? Yeah, so, so the way Containerd treats all the, the I.O. from a container is we, just, we, we send it along to the, the next one, and, and in this case, I believe, would be the kubelet okay. to be responsible so for, for how it processes it. Um, yeah, we, we made a conscious decision not to touch mm -hmm. the container output. Awesome, or, so no yeah. need uh, to change anything in container D actually. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, great, thanks. Oh, uh, another quick question to AWS. Uh, what's the plan to include uh, container D v2 uh, in EKS? It will be available just as an option? Where's my EKS team? They're here. Uh, it's, been an, it's been an option, um, I wanna say for a couple releases. So uh, it was first, uh, you know, it wasn't the default, you could choose it,
but now I believe 1.24 Kubernetes and above. Oh, I mean container the V2. Oh, V2. <laughs> ah, well, yeah. As you can see, it's not released yet. So that step one is uh, a release, and then yeah. I mean, obviously, over time, we have to validate that with EKS and other services that consume container D. So. Uh, okay. It'll, next year, <laughs> check, check with us in Paris. All right, thank you very much. Hey, yes, yeah, so I'm deploying Kubernetes in a number of air cap environments with private registries. And then what I'm doing is I'm using Container D's uh, mirroring to, you know. You can come up oh. and talk. They're, 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 yeah. Just to, to stop. So we're, we'll, we'll take questions. We'll stick around. Thank you, Friend, everybody. We'll be here.